there. Uh, this is my first online conference, so I apologize in advance if there are any slip-ups. Um, but thanks so much to uh, Blythe Institute for organizing this, and I hope it is the, uh, the first of many such events. Anyway, I have a lot of material to present, so I'm going to jump right in. Since the scientific revolution, uh, uh, really since the, the late 17th, early 18th century, of the four Aristotelian categories of cause, final causes has received, uh, have received the worst press. So Francis Bacon, uh, one of the philosophers of the scientific revolution said, uh, for the inquisition of final causes is barren and like a virgin consecrated to God produces nothing. A famous quote from his advancements of learning. Uh, in fact, however, if we think about the kinds of questions you would ask under final causation, or more simply, what is the purpose of some entity or system, that question turns out to be intimately connected to understanding how it works. So here is a supermarket automatic door, and uh, the, you know, the question, what is it designed to do? is bears directly or is intimately connected as i said to the question how does it work now in the blind watchmaker dawkins understands this early in the first chapter uh he says if i ask an engineer how a steam engine works i would have a, a pretty fair idea uh, of the general kind of answer that would satisfy me like julian huxley i should definitely not be impressed if the engineer said it was propelled by force locomotive, right? There's all kinds of knowledge to be acquired about uh, uh, in relation to the question, uh, how does it work, that is lost by compressing the answer into some kind of force like that. And I think we can agree with that. So I think Dawkins has the right intuition here. Uh, in fact, if we go back to our automatic door and we ask, how does it work? Being prompted by the question, the earlier purpose-related question, uh, what is it designed to do? We wouldn't be happy. In fact, it would be false to say the door possesses an elan vital. Uh, there's all kinds of knowledge that's lost by that kind of answer. So I think at this point, uh, the critic of, of the, the, the purpose-related question uh, is, is and I'm using Dawkins here as a contemporary example of that, um, uh, is on the right track. But Dawkins loses the thread in the very next sentence. He overshoots the mark. He says, if the engineer started boring on about the whole being greater than the sum of its parts, I would interrupt him. Never mind that. Tell me how it works. Now, it turns out, uh, in fact, for the locomotive, but almost for any comp complex functional system that one can imagine, knowing the whole and knowing why the whole is arrayed as it is, is directly connected in an information and knowledge preserving way to the question of how it works. So uh, a little very short philosophical digression. Here's a familiar taxonomy of causes. We have natural causes and intelligent causes. Uh, and uh, one way of thinking about this that I'll use uh, throughout the remainder of the talk is we have events caused by intelligence and events caused by physics. And I'm going to use physics as a shorthand for all bottom-up uh, causes where no mind is implicated. So let's get rid of the agent there. These are undirected uh, physical processes. Normally, in ordinary explanation, we do not collapse intelligence into physics. Um, and I see a question, are natural causes and intelligent causes mutually exclusive? Uh, of course not. The, uh, here I am sitting here in my office in Chicago, in some sense fully natural. Uh, there's nothing spooky about me. On the other hand, uh, a summation of all the physical processes at work within me right now that excluded my agency would not explain why I am sitting here giving this talk uh you know to the audience and so forth in other words there's explanatory content in the notion of intelligence that cannot be collapsed into physics and i don't have time today to go into a full discourse on that but let's just take it 
uh, as a given for, for the moment and, and move on. Um, Einstein is, is reported to have said this. In fact, he probably didn't, although that statement at the top makes a nice bumper sticker. What he actually said was this at Oxford. Uh, and the important intuition here, the important insight is we do not want our theories and explanations to sacrifice any part of reality. If they are doing that, they are damaging the deeper enterprise of gaining knowledge. So in the particular case that we're addressing today, uh, one of my advisors at Chicago told me, and I've never forgot this, there is no advantage to holding a desert ontology when you live in a tropical rainforest. One of the big problems I have with methodological naturalism is it commits one to an ontology that I have every reason to believe is false. So here's a desert ontology. It's nice, tidy, easy to remember, and totally sterile if I happen to live here, right, where I have to explain the origin or the, the, the behavior of a whole range of entities that have no counterpart in that nice, tidy, sterile, uh, but easy to remember, I'll give you that, desert ontology. So my thesis for this afternoon is science, in particular biology, loses nothing by allowing for the possibility of design. In fact, it gains tremendously, as I hope to show you. However, it loses a tool it cannot retrieve by excluding design. And uh, I hope to persuade you of that in the next half hour. Now we can draw a moral from what we've said so far. You've heard of Occam's razor. I want to introduce you to Leibniz's toolbox. There's Leibniz, one of my philosophical heroes. There's his toolbox right out of Google Images. And the principle of Leibniz's toolbox is quite simple. Entities should not be discarded if keeping them costs you nothing. All right, so I have tools in my garage. It's about 100 feet from where I'm sitting right now. I actually don't know what they do. They're out there. The garage is my bailiwick, my wife, it's not her territory. I will not throw them away, even though she would like me to. She likes to get rid of clutter because I know if I throw them away, you know, a day or two or a week later, I'll remember what they were for and now they're gone. The corollary for scientific explanation is equally simple. Never throw away a cause you might need, especially if you have to sneak it back later anyway, which happens all the time with methodological naturalism. Uh, a wholesale genocide is committed on higher level entities like mind, and then the investigator, the methodological naturalist, finds he needs the notion to make sense of the world, so he sneaks it back through the through the back door or the window, and the, probably never should have thrown it away in the first place. So, one one other final philosophical point, uh, just to uh, 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 establish a connection to sort of a deeper metaphysical claim that design makes, if our default assumption is primordial randomness, which is the default assumption of modern materialist or physicalist worldview, we can contrast that with a default assumption of primordial rationality. There are expectations that follow from this in terms of observation. Uh, on the left, uh, primordial randomness leads us to expect that discovery of function is going to be unlikely because function depends on the luck of the draw. We're just lucky to be here, uh, uh, metaphysically speaking, so chaos is the ground state and function is going to be unlikely. With primordial rationality, by contrast, function is caused by a designing mind that pre-existed the physical universe and thus is likely to exist even if yet observed. These consequences turn out to be uh, very tangible for biological research in a way that I'll show you at the end of the presentation. Now, philosophical preamble out of the way, design triangulation. This is a very simple idea. In fact, it's embarrassingly simple. I say that uh, as my face gets red. Here's the idea. When one discovers a complex system performing specialized functions, one should infer that a rational logic and well-matched parts are providing the functions. That may seem to be a, a truism. Here's the payoff, even if one has not yet observed those parts. Now that turns out to be very significant because if the principle is true, it underwrites biological research in the absence of evidence. 
meaning in the absence of what you're looking for, you haven't seen it yet, but you have reason to believe that it's there. This is a de facto mode of reasoning widely employed in molecular biology. Years ago, Scott Minnick uh, at Idaho told me, Paul, most molecular biologists, most geneticists are de facto design theorists. Of course, they don't give it that name. They would be embarrassed to do so, but that's actually what they're doing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in their research. Now, you might ask, well, why? You know, why should one hold this principle? Well, there's, this is where we connect to metaphysical foundation. In our universal experience, specialized functions require rational foresight design and actualization. So when we observe such functions, we can be strongly certain that the active features, parts, and functional logic are present. Or more simply, we can call this the no magic principle. This is, I think, actually what Bacon was getting at with his, uh, with his expunging of what turned out to be Aristotelian final causes. Uh, but actually, I think this idea that, that complex functional systems are not operating by magic pushes one, impels one to look for things that turn out to be knowledge. And knowledge in the sense that it connects to other pieces of knowledge, and that's what we want science to do for us. All right, so take this no magic principle seriously. Let's use our metaphor of triangulation. Now, you remember triangulation from middle school geometry in its literal sense. I recall measuring the height of a flagpole in sixth or seventh grade in terms of the length of its shadow. I want to use it not in this literal mathematical sense, but as a metaphor for scientific discovery, where we know A, we know B, and these facts, these data about the world are, are related in some way. From A and B, we can triangulate to the existence of C. We say something like C is probably the case. So let me give you a biological example. I do this with my students at Biola all the time. Uh, free copper is a poison. You do not want copper ions sloshing around the cytoplasm of your cell. It's a highly reactive metal. It can get into all kinds of mischief in places where you don't want it to be. All right, fix A in your mind. B, copper is absolutely required by aerobic organisms. It's an essential cofactor in many enzymes, for instance, in, respiratory path, in the respiratory chain. Now, from A and B, you can triangulate to the existence of C. Something must exist in any cell that's employing copper. We know it's a poison. We know we have to have it. So I've done this with students, and I say, be very literal about it. Here, you know, here I've got, you can't see me, but imagine you make your right hand into a fist. Let's say that's a copper ion. You need to get it into the cell, move it through the cell, and release it in a way that's controlled. All right, so what must be there from functional necessity? And let me tell you something. Functional necessity is incredibly strong. If you take the no magic principle seriously, functional necessity, that you have a complex system with higher level functions that's not running by magic, you have to find what's doing it. And you can, you can be certain that there may even be a formal, a, a, I think there probably is a formal logic governing how we reason that I'm only exploring here in a, in a more approximate way. But from A and B, we can infer that there is a system that binds, transports, and releases copper where the metal is needed. Now, we can go looking for it. In fact, again, the no magic principle, don't worry, it's there. This existence proof was acknowledged long before the system in question was observed. So in the uh, News article in Science Magazine in 1997 describing the discovery of this system was pointed out that copper, paradoxically, while highly toxic, is absolutely required for aerobic life. So it was known in the sense of functional necessity underwriting the inference that something was managing copper uh, as it was moving through cells to make sure that it wasn't killing those cells. The agents of trafficking and the mechanisms of delivery were not known, but there was sufficient grounds to go looking for them. And at a deeper level, what's underwriting that search, design triangulation. 
You've got a complex system. It's performing specialized functions. There's a rational logic and parts that are providing that, even if you haven't seen them. And here it is. And I won't, I won't go into any detail here, but here we have our copper ions. They're, they're coming through a pore in the membrane, bound immediately, transported, and released where needed. Now, uh, again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into this. When you read the paper, the publication describing this system, the language that's employed, and I, because I want to stay on schedule, I'm not going to read this, is highly reminiscent of design sympathies. I, in fact, I would bet that at least one of the authors of this paper, probably more, had some design sympathies. I'll just mention this one phrase. This is unlikely to proceed by spontaneous self-assembly. Love that language. Now. Let's raise the temperature a little bit and tell a story with these two characters. Uh, the hero of the piece will be Francis Crick on the right, who was a much better biologist than he was an atheist, and the villain will be James Watson. Now, you need to forget any cell biology, any genetics, any molecular biology that you might have learned and transport yourself to the mid-1950s when it was known that DNA was the primary carrier of hereditary information. And it was also known that proteins were assembled from amino acids, and these are going to be the constituents of the major actors in cell biology. But looking at this, Francis Crick is puzzled. How is the very regular geometry of DNA, the sugar phosphate backbone, uh, as sort of the 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 legs or, or the spine of the ladder, quite regular in terms of its chemistry, the rungs of the ladder, the hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides. How is this very regular chemistry specifying these very irregular amino acids? So the question is, how is information transfer being mediated from this chemistry to this chemistry? And here's how Crick put it puts it in an unpublished paper, the, uh, 1955 circulated to the RNA tie club. He says, what I find profoundly disturbing is I cannot keep conceive of any structure for either nucleic acid acting as a direct template for amino acids. No one looking at DNA or RNA would think of them as templates to perform that function. And he goes on, where are the knobbly hydrophobic surfaces to distinguish valine from leucine and isoleucine? Uh, and so forth. What the DNA structure does show, and probably RNA will do the same, is a specific pattern of hydrogen bonds and very little else. But remember the principle of design triangulation. Now, when I say that Crick was a better biologist than, what he, than he was an atheist, what Crick is doing is taking the reality of the higher level functions seriously and saying, look, this cell is not running by magic somehow information is being transferred from nucleic acids to amino acids, so he triangulates. DNA carries information, but is chemically nonspecific. Amino acids have specific geometries. All right, from A and B, we can triangulate to C. Therefore, mediating adapter molecules must exist to enable specifying information to pass from DNA to amino acids. All right, so he says, Something is mediating information transfer here, and it's not happening by magic. So there's got to be some entity, some system intervening here to enable this to happen because the inference from functional necessity is very strong. So he triangulates. Now remember, in the mid 50s, none of this was known. There was no observational evidence for what Crick is doing. He on the basis of functional necessity and design triangulation, he's saying these, there, there must be something in the space, functional space between nucleic acid and amino acids that's doing the following. <coughs> it would have, a, it would be a small molecule that would bind with, uh, have a hydrogen bonding surface. Uh, so on one side, it's, it is interacting with nucleic acid and it would combine there would have to be 20 of these, excuse me, because there's got to be one for each amino acid and 20 dedicated enzymes to join the amino acids to the adapters. And the, they, this came to have the name, the adapter hypothesis. So 
Let's take valine, just as our representative here. Uh, and again, remember, no, no direct evidence for any of this at the time that Crick is predicting it, it, its existence. All right, so there, here's our adapter. It's going to have a surface that binds to nucleic acid. At the other hand, end, it will bind to a specific amino acid. In order for that to happen, there has to be a dedicated enzyme that will do that job, that will grab valine out of the cytoplasm uh, and not any of the other 19 amino acids and attach it to the adapter. This Crick, I think, grasps must be a semantic relationship. In other words, this surface is going to mean this amino acid, all right? And you need 20. So this is a deductive inference from functional necessity that these features must be present. He acknowledges that there is no such evidence. This objection, he says, however, cannot stand. Why? Because the inference from, inference from system or higher level functional necessity is very strong. All right. Now, years later, many years later, following the prediction, transfer RNA was isolated and characterized. And it had all the features Crick said it would need to have. Here is our nucleic acid binding surface here at the anticodon. This is going to be the messenger RNA strand down here. 75 angstroms away at the other end of the molecule, you have the amino acid binding surface. And it is a semantic relation. This codon binding with this anticodon is going to mean alanine. There will be no direct chemical interaction between the two. Now the villain, Watson. Watson didn't like the adapter hypothesis, and not just because he thought Crick was always shooting his mouth off. Why didn't Watson like it? Not because the inference from functional necessity had gone astray in some way. Rather, it was too complicated to have evolved at the origin of life. What's the problem for Watson? His biological intuition is constrained by an implicit time axis. Looks like this. All right, time is running from past to present, uh, the events of the accretion of biological complexity are happening along that time axis. The origin of life would be one of those events. Because organisms are fundamentally historical entities, history is was just one damn thing after another. And this would be true, of course, for abiogenesis. Biological complexity can only accrete over time. In short, the parts must precede the whole. The whole emerges from the parts. The whole is not causally primary. This is, I think, the, one of the fundamental design insights that design or a non-naturalistic approach to biology can bring to bear. Holes can be causally primary. I'll say more about that in a moment. All right, Watson looks at this and he says, I've already got DNA and RNA as information carriers. I already have proteins made of amino acids as the main actors in the cell. You, my colleague Francis Crick, are asking me to accept a third adapter molecule that's mediating information transfer between these two spheres. That's too much all at once. Too complicated to evolve at the origin of life. So. Watson does this, and he misses the mark because this is real. You can't understand cell biology without it. All right. Remember, however, in a design conception, an intelligent designer need not be bound by a time axis. So we can get rid of the time axis. And because the car parts do not need to causally precede the whole, we can say, given the Functional requirements of the organism as a whole, whether a single cell or a multicellular organism, in both cases, the organism is causally primary. This turns Dawkins' view of genetics on its head or stands it on its head. With Dawkins and really with any Darwinian reductionist, the arrow of causality runs from genes outward to the organism. On this view, the organism is causally primary. The whole ontologically proceeds its parts, and we can infer from the functions of the whole to the parts without any loss of explanatory power, although it does do some damage to the naturalistic understanding of reality. But let me give you an example uh, from organismal biology 
where I think this, uh, this has made, been made very plain. So we have three classically non-homologous eyes. What do these organs share? They're photon detectors, right? But classically in evolutionary theory, these eyes never shared a common ancestor that in any organism that was also an eye. They evolved independently of each other in metazoan history. It turns out, however, discoveries in the 90s showed that the development of each of these eyes is regulated. The cascade leading to each of these eyes is regulated by the gene PAC6, or it's also known as eyeless. Yet, these are, <coughs> these are classically non-homologous, OK? Now, one of the potentials, explanatory potentials that, that intelligent design gives you is that we can view genes and protein products like PAC6 or ILIS as modules. And so let's very quickly do a design theoretic thought experiment using natural language that takes the reality of higher levels seriously. So I did this years ago, and it's incorporated in Steve Meyer's book, Darwin's Doubt, in one of the later chapters. Uh, you can do this for any text, any text in any natural language. This is the last 44 words of the Gettysburg Address. I break it down into a lexicon. Here it is. Now, from this lexicon, I, as author, can rearrange these lower level modules uh, to convey a meaning very different from that of Abraham Lincoln. So I, this is what I did. I wrote an anarchist manifesto. The meaning of this text is diametrically opposite to that of Lincoln. You know what Lincoln was intending to do with the Gettysburg Address, persuade the American nation to continue on through the horrible suffering of the Civil War. You know what he was trying to convey, the meaning he was trying to convey using the very same words, the very same lower level modules at roughly the same frequency, I'm able to write a text that's diametrically opposite in meaning to that of Lincoln. What's going on here? What's going on is the higher level unit, namely the paragraph, governed by my intent, the purpose, right? I can change the direction that these modules go, if you will, once they're arranged in a certain pattern, so this is genuine top-down causation, where the higher level structure is governing the function of the lower level parts. These, and we see the, these realities of high, the reality of the higher level all the time. So just a few days ago, uh, actually two days ago, I returned from Los Angeles where I was working with Illustra Media on their new movie about the origin of life. One of the things that they're gonna be explaining in that film is that cellular functions are all interrelated in a complex web such that you take away any of them and you lose all of them. Uh, and cell biologists know this. This is not spooky or mis mysterious in any way. What it tells you, though, is the causal primacy in terms of function of the higher level. If you take this seriously, you have to change your view on the origin of life. Now, unfortunately, I have run out of time. Uh, uh, the next series of examples that I was going to give you relate to ways in which, in fact, I've got another 20 minutes, unfortunately. I did not time this properly, but maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, uh, Jonathan, are you there? I'm here. You, you can okay. do another five minutes if you want. All right, let me very quickly take this example because I think it's quite interesting. Uh, the, when the genome of the whales, uh, of the minke whale was uh, determined, when it was mapped in its entirety, and whales nest in evolutionary terms within this clade, it's the set Artiodactyla. There's a lot of morphological diversity here in this group, all right? So when you look at the features that make a whale or a dolphin what it is, I mean, it's quite a long list. The surprise is what wasn't found in terms of the anatomy, development, specialized functions of the minke whale. What wasn't found in its whole, in its, when the whole genome was mapped were proteins that were unique to cetacea that were not found in any other member, member of that clade. 
So I'm going to skip over this for the sake of time. Uh, I'll just summarize what those slides said. If you look in the genome of a minke whale, what you find in terms of the proteins is going to be largely the same as any other member of this group. So what explains the morphological diversity uh, and all the unique features of cetacea relative to the other members of this group, given that their proteins are pretty much all the same? So here's our puzzle. Cetaceans exhibit hundreds of unique, well, thousands, really, of unique features. And uh, those of you who have seen the film Living Waters know this. You've heard Rick Sternberg talk about it. This, we could spend a whole seminar just on the unique features present in cetacea. Yet, their protein coding genes are largely the same as any other member of the set art artiodactyla. All right, from A and B, we have a puzzle. We can triangulate our way to Something very puzzling. What explains cetacean uniqueness? You know, there is something here that makes a whale or a dolphin what it is that is not present at the level of the protein modules. Maybe the answer lies in their junk. All right. So you probably know only a very small fraction of our genome, and I'll say I'll generalize this to mammalian genomes, actually codes for proteins. But as Projects in Code and Modern Code discovered, all the rest is transcribed into RNA, including stuff long thought to be debris. Maybe the mystery of whale and dolphin uniqueness is hidden in the junk in this very much larger fraction. Dan Grauer doesn't like that idea. And he has set out to destroy Project ENCODE. In fact, in a talk that he gave that was later published as this paper in 2013, at the Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution, he put it this way. And this is actually his slide. I took this right out of his presentation. If, I'll summarize this, if, there, if the so-called junk fraction of the genome turns out to be functional, he says, evolution is wrong. So he just makes it as about as stark, puts the point about as starkly as one can. In fact, this is also his slide. I mean, this is, this is, his drawing, he's put, he's put bullet holes and blood running down a diagram from the ENCODE publication. What's a good research avenue to try? Cetaceans exhibit hundreds of unique features. Their genes, meaning their protein coding genes, are largely the same as other members of that clade. The code for cetacean features may reveal itself to a design-based analysis of non-coding DNA. Let's do it. Uh, I'll conclude by telling you some good news. Discovery Institute has obtained significant funding for what they call ID 3.0, which is to, to begin design-based analyses in genetics, in developmental biology, in several different areas, uh, in a sense saying to the neo-Darwinians, look, we can't refute you guys because your commitment is not to science, it's to, it's to naturalism. So we're just going to do design-based research and see what we can discover. This will be, this kind of project of looking for functions in junk DNA will be one of the projects in ID 3.0. All right, sorry, I ran over. The moderator very nicely gave me a little extra time, but I suppose I should take a few questions before we call it a, a session. Yeah, I think I think it's open for anyone to talk. Just unmute your microphone and uh, and ask ask your questions, or you can type them out. Um, hi, Paul. This is Jim Johansson. I'm a, one of your former students at Biola, so I appreciate that. Also, yeah, I'm really glad to see the development of what you're doing. I think this is profound. And it's also impacting some of the research I'm trying to, to do. So just just kind of a um, clapping for you. I think this is a really great idea, and I think it's um, something that has a lot of um, utilities that I'm hoping to, as along with others, to, to leverage. So thank you for this. You're welcome. So one thing, have you ever read any of uh, Dominic Halsmer's stuff? He's done a lot on, uh, I think he's published in Design and Nature and a few other places. Um, but when you were talking about the uh, looking for, um, you know, how what does it do and how does it work? Um, he's actually uh, has a term for that from engineering. Um, there's a specific. I'm trying to look it up. Uh, affordances. Um, 
And uh, have you heard that term in reverse engineering? I, I, I haven't. I have to tell you that I'm I'm really at. The, I I myself am just leaving the starting gate on this. Uh, there's an enormous literature in engineering that I want to explore, and also I there are. Um, uh, I believe probably formal principles that can be extracted from functional necessity. And I have two very nerdy geniuses on the line who are going to help me with this, uh, both of them mathematically quite gifted, because I have the sense that there is probably a formal, a formal methodological language or a formal analytical language that emerges from functional necessity that once you know how to use it, you should be able just to walk your way, uh, not having to lean on intuition, but in a sense, actually calculate the existence of functional entities within complex systems if you know enough of the relevant details. Uh, so I hope in a year's time to have you working with these two guys, one in Canada uh, and one in Utah, to begin to lay this out in a way where I could hand it to someone and say, take your system, and if you use this formal method, you should be able to figure out what, you're, what you need to look for and where it is. But okay. I, will look at, I will look at Dominic Halter. I have not read yeah. his, his stuff. All right, Jim Master says, uh, if these systems are driven by organism functionality, i.e. their causal primacy, could we, uh, could we say that it is equivalent to teleology? It is equivalent to teleology, and this is why I started with Francis Bacon, because I think final causes uh, have received an unfair knock. Almost any complex system, either natural or uh, that is biological or, or artificial contrived by us, has purposes that are perfectly real. And because they are real, these functions, uh, even when we are totally ignorant of their constituents, underwrite the search for their constituents. You know, it's hard to do science. And it's nice to know that when you go into the lab and raise the blinds, or you go to sit down at your computer to do an analysis, that what you're looking for is actually there that you're going to be rewarded at the end of your search by finding something and learning something you didn't know before. And that's what I find so attractive about this idea and want to work on it, because I think that teleology actually is enormously fruitful once you discipline your reasoning about it in terms of yielding knowledge. What was Crick doing? Crick was doing a teleological analysis of that system using the no magic principle. It's not working by magic, right? There's had to be something there. To, to, to span the functional space between those two chemical geometries. And when, when Crick thought like a design theorist, he made wonderful discoveries. When he thought like an atheist, he didn't. So what, that's why he's one of my heroes. You know, I, I could still remember reading that paper, that 1955 paper, and realizing this gains its justification sort of on a, on a deeper level, not from anything he believes about the world, really, but from, you know, what he's actually intuiting, and that is he's following the design thread. All right, we have time for one more question. All right, so um, we have the, the next question is design-based analysis of non-coding DNA sounds very interesting. Could you tell us more about how design-based analysis dis differs from methodologically naturalistic analysis of non-coding DNA as in ENCODE, and what gives it the advantage here? Do you mean knowledge from engineering and how humans design them? Well, I think the first, the first insight would be system first. All right, it's an embarrassment to, to evolutionary theory to have to move up to higher levels when it thinks those higher levels were actually constructed from their parts. So they have to violate their own narrative or, or ignore their own narrative. <coughs> That's not a problem for a design theorist. A design theorist can say the, the, the upper level, the system as a whole, is causally primary. And what that means is, for instance, in terms of junk DNA, <coughs> junk DNA is a, is a paradox or puzzle for evolution 
because the, the model that they're using for DNA functionality begins with the parts, right? You've got an open reading frame. What is the job of the open reading frame? It's the code for a protein. It's a reductionist analysis. And you build from that up to the higher levels. In, in the, 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 approach, the approach that I'm encouraging, you start with the higher levels, the functions that are present there. You, you know, in, the, in Cetacea, start with their anatomical features and say, if I don't see the code in the proteins, and it, really it's not there because if you look at the proteins of a whale or a dolphin, they're pretty much the same as what you would find in any other member of that group that has a very different morphology. So you say, I see these unique features. They're not present, or they at least not obviously present at the protein coding level. Where else might they be? Well, there's this very large fraction, putative junk, non-coding fraction. The code is probably there. I'm justified in going to look for it because cetacea are not being built by magic. All right? So, uh, you, you turn the problem around, you start with the reality of the higher level, and which is an embarrassment to, it. again, on a neo-Darwinian narrative, start with the higher level and work down from there, top down into the parts to see, in effect, the organism is telling its parts what's to, what to do, and not the non-coding DNA may help us get a handle on that. 